ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب اليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم All praises are for Allah. We, we praise Him, we thank Him, we ask Him for His help, and we ask Him for His forgiveness. We, we seek refuge to Allah Ta'ala from the evil of ourselves and the evil of our actions. Whoever is guided by Allah, then no one can misguide them, and whoever is misguided, then no one can guide them except for Allah Ta'ala. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is His final messenger and Abad. First of all, my dearest sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, it's always an honour and pleasure to be here at the, with the beautiful UMA sisters, alhamdulillah. Um, so inshallah, the topic that I was asked to speak about today is the, the rulings on menses. So I'm asking Allah Ta'ala that the information I share with you today, inshallah, should help you in working out your problems you know regarding menses because you know i know as a teacher that you know subhanallah um one of the main questions i get asked like there wouldn't be a day that goes past except that some sister messages me and asks me something about her menstruation and ramadan it just that's when it <laughs> that's when it just pulled like literally i just get you know I don't know how to explain. So many inboxes and questions the minute Ramadan hits, it's like, oh, suddenly everyone's got, a main, main, you know, all these problems. Um, but, you know, just to make yourself feel a little bit better, because it is very, you know, we do get quite confused at times with our cycles, like, you know, your cycles can change, and especially with, um, you know, the things we use today with contraception and stuff like that, that all has is having a big effect. You know, they wouldn't have had those kind of, they didn't have that, you know, effect in the past that makes differences with our menses. But, you know, to understand that if you find it difficult, even the fuqaha found this particular topic difficult. Like it's considered one of the most or more difficult, you know, parts of, of fiqh due to, you know, a lot of differences of opinion in it and stuff like that. But, um, you know, Imam Ahmed, he said he took about nine years to actually um, understand this topic properly. Like, it, it, it does take a lot of time to kind of really pick through all the adilla, like all the, you know, proofs on the topic to really, and put it all together to, to really understand the way it all works. But um, we'll get straight into it. So, you know, basically we can divide the blood that a woman sees into three different types. So you've got the menses, which, you know, is a natural blood, um, that, that comes to the woman who has reached puberty and it comes, it comes on known days, at a known time. Okay, so that definition is actually quite significant to know that it's, it comes at a known time for you know, a known amount of days. Like it's, it's what is usually comes to her. Okay, whereas irregular bleeding, which we call alistahada, the blood of alistahada, this is the irregular bleeding that in general she sees at other times other than her normal cycle. And then you've got the postnatal bleeding, which is obviously the blood that's associated with childbirth. So we'll be looking at all three of these types of, of um, blood today to understand how, you know, we, like what are the rulings um, that we need to be concerned about in regards to these. Okay, so starting off with menses, because this is obviously the main part of the topic. Um, so how, let's first of all talk about how to distinguish um, between that menses blood, how to know whether it's menses blood or whether it's alistihada, whether it's, you know, the irregular bleeding. So the first thing that distinguishes in general between the, the blood of al hayd which is the, the, you know, the menses blood, is usually it's the dark colour. Okay, so the dark colour. And then the next thing is the, the thickness, that usually the, the blood is heavy. Okay, and also 
Uh, the other thing is the offensive smell. So if we compare that on the other hand to the alistehada blood, the irregular bleeding, then we would say that irregular bleeding is normally, it normally tends to come like a bright red, like very bright, of course. And it, the other thing, add into it what I said before, it comes at a time different than your period, okay? That's very significant. Then the other thing as well is that it tends to be thin and, and light. And then the other thing is it doesn't usually have an offensive smell, like it doesn't have the same smell as your, your, the odour of your menses. Another thing that doctors added here too is that the blood of Alistair blood, the irregular bleeding blood, congeals because it's thin. So you know when you bleed, you'll find that that blood clots quickly. Normal blood that's not from the, 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 the lining of the uterus, like what is, what is the mens menses blood? It's the lining from the uterus. So it doesn't tend to, it's not going to tend to clot. Whereas the irregular bleeding, because it's thin, it's thin blood coming from another place, okay, it's, it tends to clot. So that's another thing that is another way of distinguishing it. Okay. All right, let's talk about, so, okay, so that's, that's in regarding how to distinguish between the menses blood and then how to distinguish that between that and the irregular bleeding. Now, the other thing is, we need to talk about what are the colours of the menses blood, because menses blood doesn't just come in one colour, as I think most of you know by now. Just to understand that the menses blood, it can be like dark, like very dark, almost like a blackish colour. It can be like a reddish colour. It can be a brown colour. It can also be yellow. All right? So now we're, when we're talking about the blood, like when we see, if we see, I'm going to talk now about what is the ruling on the brown and yellow that we see, right? So the brown and yellow, if it's, if it's joined to the period, then we, we take the ruling that it's part of the period, okay? But if you see that brown and yellow after you've like already got clean and you've seen the sign of purity from menses, then we don't consider it as period, okay? According to... Um, like the majority of like scholars, okay? So, some scholars do consider that as um, something, but like according to the proofs we have, because for example, give from the proofs that um, Umm Atiya, she said, "Kunna la naudul kudra was sufra baad tuhri shay'a." We did not consider al kudra, which is the brown discharge, was sufra, which is the yellow discharge, after a tuhr after becoming purified from menses as anything. Okay, so therefore we know that if it's after the time, like we finished our menses and we saw the sign and everything and then we saw some yellow after that, we don't worry about it, okay? But if it's inside the menses, because you know usually with most women, it's like it goes red, then it goes brown, then it goes yellow and then it sort of either fades out or you see white at the end. So that yellow and brown you see during the, the cycle, it's, it's, it's part of your... Um, it's part of your menses. By the way, if you've got questions on what I'm saying, write them down. We can discuss it at the end because when we're talking about women's cycles, this is why it was so hard for the Fulka hat in the first place. Like, how many women are in this room and how many women are in this world? And everyone, like, we have the normal, but then we have other, you know, one, one shoe doesn't fit everybody, okay? So you might have something different with you, so we might have to talk about that. We'll talk about it at the end so we can save some time. Um, but anyway, the point is here that to just to understand that the menses blood can it, it can also be brown and yellow, especially like I said, it's coming in the time of the actual menses. All right, so that's the next thing we have to understand. Then, after that, um, the length of time of the menses. All right, the length of time of the menses. Now, just to understand something, there's no proof in the Quran or Sunnah that stipulates. A specific time for like how it was you know what's the longest time of menses or what's the shortest time of menses however the fuqaha based upon the ada based upon the ada which means like like what's normal amongst women they based their ruling they gave some rulings on al ada you know um, for women so for example now um, from the from from the from the rulings they gave for example is that a period should be at least a day and a night 
To consider it as a period, you would, it would need to be at least a day and a night. Okay? But in saying that, because like we said, not, every, not one shoe fits every woman in this world. So in saying that, if you, you could be, maybe in your family, you've got something, because sometimes in some families, they just have this certain thing where every month they have a period that lasts 12 hours. And that's all they get every month. It's possible to happen. So if that was coming every month, at a certain time, I mean, that would be awesome, I know. <laughs> but if that was coming like for 12 hours every month, we could still say, based upon what happened, you know, because that's coming at a regular time and a known time, we could still rule on it as a period, do you understand? But in general, what I'm saying to you is, if it comes less than a day and a night, we won't consider it as a period. Then as for the, what's the maximum time? Okay, so again, you've got difference of opinion amongst the fuqaha, but majority, jumhur al they're of the view the maximum is 15. Why? Because... Like I know, you know, I know the Hanafi Madhab. It says ten, but if you if you go talk to many women, you'll find a lot of women get it twelve days. They get it over ten. So that's why I'm saying al ada muhakkama. Like that's what the there's a rule in usul al fiqh that says what is the the ada? It becomes the ruling. So the, the scholars, you know, they base their rulings on 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 many you know things, and that's one of them. And so here we see that because. Amongst women, it's, it's quite common to find women having periods even up to like 12, and, but they said the maximum 15, because why they said 15? Because if she gets a period for 15 days, and as we're gonna see in a minute, what is the time that you should have as duhur in between, should be at least 13 or 15 days in between, then if it's, if it's more than 15 days, that means most of the month she won't be praying. She won't be fasting if it's Ramadan. That's why they said 15 days. If it's more than that, it must be istahada. If it's going on and on, it, it is, it's a sign that it must be istahada. It must be the irregular bleeding to, to go more than that. Okay, so that's that's basic. Just This is all just giving you some guidelines. That, you know, inshallah, if you understand these guidelines, it can really help you solve your, your problems um, without messaging me. Okay, inshallah. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm here to actually save my own headaches. All right, but then again, I could be opening a whole can of worms right now. <laughs> anyway, so um, okay, so that's the that's regarding the um, the longest length of time, and then um, okay, and then in you know as for a tuhur, as for for the tuhur in between, like I had just alluded to, that you know um, majority of scholars are of the view that it should be at least fifteen days. Like now, the Hanbali say 13. So even if it was 13, but you know what I'm trying. To, what's the use of knowing this? Because if you had your period already, okay, and then seven days later you suddenly saw blood again, you wouldn't think to yourself straight away that that's period because you've just had a period, and now you're seeing this blood. So you wouldn't think because you know the Fuqaha said it should be at least 15, right, or at least 13, but not. Not, not just to come like seven days later. Unless, let me just say something here too, and this is another exception, you're going through menopause, okay? Because when you go through menopause, your period can go haywire. So I would say in the beginning, if it, especially if it's got those characteristics of it's the harder blood, which I said before, and it's coming after seven days, I wouldn't think period straight away, right? But if it came seven days later and you know you're going through menopause and then you, you know you're perimenopausal and then you see that it's looking exactly like a period, then you most you, you're gonna you're gonna have to take it as a period in that case. Do you understand? So this is how you have to work. But in general, we say if you saw blood after seven days, you won't take it as your period because it's not even you haven't even had 15 day tuhur in between. Um Okay, then another, another, another subject to talk about is how the cycle can change in length. Okay, now you have to understand that our cycles are not stagnant. And I think you know that by now. <laughs> You've had it long enough. Right, so it starts out, you might have had it six days when you were little and then you have a baby and it turns out to be ten and then... You have another baby, it turns out to be five. Like, it's, it's just always changing. You go on the pill, it changes. You, you take an IUD. Yeah, I mean, everything changes, everything changes the, the, the menses. Um, 
So looking at everything, looking at the evidences, if we look at what Allah Ta'ala told us in the Quran, right? In Surah Baqarah 222, He tells us, where yes, alunaka anil mahid. They ask you about al mahid. They ask you about, you know, the menses. قُلْ هُوَ أَذَنْ فَاعْتَزِلُ النِّسَاءَ فِي الْمَحِيضِ حَتَّى uh, Okay, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوهُنَّ حَتَّى يَطْهُمْ Right? So, um, avoid women when they're in their, when they're in their um, cycles and because it's an other. It's a, it's a hurt and a harm. Okay? So, what we see is Allah Ta'ala tied al-hukum, he tied the ruling to the blood. To the presence of blood so that's why we're saying that as long as you can still see that blood it's your time for your menses and you can still see the blood it's still continuing you haven't seen any break like it hasn't stopped you didn't see tuhur then you'll consider it as still your, your menstruation that 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 that's what you'll see until it finishes but then as i said if it's going too long it's going past 15 days now you start thinking wait something's not right do you know what I'm trying to say? So the, don't, because your period could change at any moment. Like it could be six days now, but then in, an, in, in a, like after a year or so, it could be, it could go to eight days. You can't say, oh, well, my previous period was six. I'm just going to start praying, but you've still got blood. You've still got blood. All right. So this is why you need to, like I said, Allah Ta'ala tied al-hukum to the presence, to the presence of the blood. Okay. Um. Okay, another issue is sometimes, this is where you start panicking, um, <laughs> where you're in your period and then suddenly you're in like day two and then suddenly <gasps> my period's not there. What happened to it? I know my period goes for six days, seven days, but it just stopped and it's not there. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to pray? Am I supposed to, you know, like, <laughs> this is where you start ringing people up. What do I do? Anyway, but the, look, um, just to talk about this. So, look, a bit of a general guideline. If, it's, if, it stops for, if it stops for a whole day and night, then I would say if it stops for about 20, you know, 24 hours, it doesn't look like it's coming back, you can go check. Because, look, the, the default is you're still in your period, okay? Because there's a, another rule in Ulusul Fiqh which teaches us, al yaqinu la yazulu bishak. Right? So certainty is not removed with doubt. So right now, I'm certain I've got my period, but I doubt I've become clean. So there is, a, a, there is a, like a, an athar from Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhu, who said that whenever she sees tuhur, she goes and takes wuls and she prays. Okay, so... Just to, so just to show you, so now if that happened to you, my advice would be go and check. For example, if you're you know, married and all that, you could check, for example, with a bit of cotton bud or something like that to see is there still, is there still blood. If there's just nothing at all, after 20, like 24 hours is gone, there's just nothing, take us and start to pray. St take us and start to pray. Um, because sometimes the period can just stop for a few days. Now... There are other scholars, for example, um, by memory, I think it's um, the Hanafis. So they ruled that even the, the Tuhur in between, it's still, um, it's still part of the period. Like now, so this one saying, if it's a short time, we need, we need to go in between the two views. Because one view says, even if it's two days, you don't have to pray during that time. Do you understand? The other view says, as soon as you see um, purity, which could be six hours, Take loose and start praying. Now, you know, as a woman, that'll be so hard to have to every six hours, you don't get something, you, you know. So there's a Imam, uh, Ibn Qudama, so he's a Hanbali scholar. He says in al Mughni, and I'll quote you the quote, and it really does help you. It says, if blood stops for less than one day, the state cannot be considered as a tahara. It cannot be considered as tahara unless she sees clear evidence. Either the blood stops at the end of her period or she sees... Al Qasdul Bayda, which I'm going to talk about, the, which is the white discharge, right? So, so this this opinion, as as ulama have stated, is opinion an opinion between the two extremes of like not praying for many days when you don't see anything, because I've known of sisters, and this can happen, where some people have a cycle where they have like a two day cycle. Then they have like two days or three days of absolutely nothing, and then the rest of their cycle comes. 
like for another three days. That, that's possible. Like there are people I've come across that have that, you know. So that's why, imagine she's not praying for two or three days in between. You know, it's too long. But at the same time, if you take the other view that like, oh, after six hours I saw clean. Now, you know, you're going to be backwards and forwards to the shower and like it's going to be it's going to be so hard for us, subhanAllah. So you need to, you know, so that's why we, um, that's why we take this view in between, inshallah. You know what I mean? Okay, the next thing is what is the sign of purity? What is the sign of purity? Okay, so the well-known sign which is mentioned in um, a narration from Aisha radiallahu anha is it's called al-qasr al-bayda which means the white discharge. Okay, so this is a white discharge that the uterus releases at the end of the, the menses. Um, this does not occur for everybody though. Not everybody gets this. You might not have even noticed it before. I don't want to go into too much details, but it's like a sticky little blob. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but it's good to know because you're, going, you're probably going to go home next time and go, oh. <laughs> Is that what she was talking about? <laughs> anyway. So anyway, um, if you don't see that, so not everybody gets that. So then the other sign, there's two signs. That's the first sign. The other sign is you just get absolutely nothing. So what I could say, the best way of describing it, is it goes from red to brown to yellow and then it just fades out to nothing. So when you see the nothing, that's when you know you're clean and you've got to take this. Now, how do we know this? Because just like you, the Sahabi ads, they used to be really worried, have I finished my period or not? And they, you know, but they didn't used to phone up people or send them messages, they used to. Go in person, <laughs> believe it or not, they would even send their bits of pad. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I'm glad I'm living this time, not the past. <laughs> and it had some traces of yellow on it. And they would ask, ask Aisha, you know, should I pray now or not? Am I clean? And she would say, لا تعجلنا حتى ترين القصة البيضاء. Do not rush until you see the white discharge. So you don't, like, you don't have to have a panic attack at the end of your um, period, <laughs> you know what I mean? You've still got the yellow, you're still not clean, just wait till it's all gone, and think about the Sahabiyat, they were in the same position as you, you know, they were worried as well, but she told them, and she knows best, she was the wife of the Prophet وسلم, and she used to get menses just like you and me. Okay, so she knows, mashallah, the best, okay? <laughs> so just remind yourself of that hadith. It helps you put your mind to rest. Okay. Now, moving on, we're now going to talk about um, 10 rules that are associated with the menses. Okay? So these are 10 rulings, um, the, the 10 main rulings associated, associated with menses. Um, seven or eight kind of relate to forbidden things, things that a woman can't do when she's menstruating, and two of them relate to obligatory things um, she needs to do. All right, so let's talk about this. So number one, obviously, is it's forbidden to pray while you've got your menses. And so not only is prayer, you know, not obligatory on her while she's in the state of menses, but it's actually haram for her to pray as well. So that's another thing to say to yourself. Like, some people say, but it's how you're know, missing prayers, you know. But it's also hard on for you to pray while you're in your menses too. So, you know, you need to be sure that you've actually finished. Okay? Um, and if she prayed in a state of menses, her prayer is not correct. It's not valid. It wouldn't be accepted. So that's, that's the way to look at it. And the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, um, in which, you know... Like he, he told Fatima bint Abi Hubaysh that, you know, when the menses, you know, comes to you, then leave prayer. When the menses comes to you, then leave prayer. So it's, it's very clear that, you know, you need to um, leave the prayers while you're in menses. And also there's a hadith or it's a narration from Aisha radiallahu anha in which she said, we used to menstruate at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and we were ordered to make up for our fasts and we were not ordered to make up for our prayer. So that's how we know that we don't need to make up for all the prayers. And that's a rahmah from Allah Ta'ala because obviously making up for a day of fasting is so much easy. Like it's easy compared to like, imagine if we had to, you know, for every day five prayers and we had to pray them all at the end. It would, it would have been very hard for us, subhanAllah. 
Um, but let's just talk quickly about some rulings. So, some of the rulings on um, regarding the, the you know menstruation and prayer. So, um, you know, majority of scholars are of the view that if you um, like, for example, now if you if you menstruate, you know, in it after the adhan for a prayer time, and there was enough time for you to have prayed, then that prayer would be an obligation on you when you finish from your menses, from your menses. Okay, if you had enough time to pray, then there was, you know, it, it's like considered to be an obligation that you would need to make it up. You know, obviously you're not sinful or anything because you've got the whole prayer time to um, pray. But you do need to make up that prayer after you get clean from menses. And then the other thing as well is that when you become clean, if you become clean in a prayer time where the prayers can be joined for a person of excuse, because, you know, with when you travel, you'll know that there are certain prayers we're allowed to combine. So, Luha Nasr is a prayer time we can combine between if we're, we're, when we're traveling. Also, at Maghrib and Alisha. Okay, so the scholars said that if you get clean in the latter prayer time of Asr, for example, that you should still uh, pray your Dhuhr as well as the Asr. Or if you got clean, clean in, in Aisha time, you should get you should pray Maghrib and Aisha. Okay, but if you got clean after the sun came up, you don't need to pray Fajr. Because the prayer time has finished for Fajr. Prayer time for Fajr finishes at sunrise. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind. Then when it comes to fasting, that's the second thing. So this is the second ruling. So as we know, it's not allowed for the woman to fast while she's menstruating. But like we said, she has to make up for it when she finishes. Um, <clears throat> and just quickly, you know that if you get clean before the Adhan for Fajr in Ramadan, you need to put your intention to fast that day. Okay, you need to put your intention to fast that day. And it's not a necessity to have al ghusl Like you don't have to rush to the shower and take an ghusl in order to start fasting. So you can start fasting without having taken your ghusl. Okay, so just understand that. Okay, but you need to you need to put your intention that I'm going to fast this day because I can see I'm clean. So therefore, the fast is now obligatory upon me. Okay. The third point or the third um, issue is a tawaf. Okay, so if we look at what the the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told Aisha when she got menses during Hajj, he told her, "If Ali mayafalu al-Hajj." Do everything that the Hajj does. غَيْرَ أَلَّا فِي الْبَيْتِ حَتَّى حتى So, um, do everything the Hajj does except to make tawaf of, of you know, um, to, uh, tawaf of the Kaaba. Don't make tawaf of the Kaaba, right? Um, until you become purified. Until you become purified, right? So, from this we know that it's not allowed to do tawaf in the state of menses. And then a, a fourth point that scholars have spoken about is, re is regarding the reciting of the Qur'an. Okay, now here I just need to mention that we need to understand something that the, all the, 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 particular, the, the hadiths that were, any hadiths that were narrated about a woman reciting the Qur'an there's nothing that's authentic, actually. Okay, they're actually all um, considered to be weak hadiths, and that's why there was a difference of opinion amongst fuqaha regarding reciting the Quran. And another thing that they made qiyas, which means analogy, on the recite, you know, sorry, on the menstruating woman and the junub, like the junub, as in the one in state of janaba, like from intimacy with with one's wife. Right? So the thing about this is that if we look at Al Qiyas, if we look at the Qiyas, we can see that there's a big difference between a person in a state of Janaba and them being able to remove their state of Janaba. Like all they have to do is go to take Ghus and it's just a few minutes and then they'll remove their Janaba. Whereas the woman, when she's in a state of menses, 
how can she lift that? How can she, you know, she can't, like, you don't, do you understand? So she has to wait seven days. And then what if she needs to revise her Quran? What if she needs to learn the Quran? What if she just needs to connect? Do you understand? So this is why um, the other opinion is that um, because there's no strong evidence, there's actually no strong evidence to show, to forbid a woman from reciting the Quran, then especially if she's a teacher or she's revising or she's, you know, memorizes the Quran or something like that, or she has a wirt even, like she, every day she's a certain amount that she always recites. They said that, you know, inshallah, there's no harm in her reciting the Quran due to that. Okay. But the next thing is related to this, which is touching the Quran. Okay. Touching the Quran. And when we say touching the Quran, we're not talking about the English translation. We're not talking about the English translation. We're not talking about a book that has English and Arabic in it or Arabic in other languages. All right? We're talking about the actual actual mushaf that only has Arabic. Okay? Now, in regards to this, the, dif the difference is that there's a famous letter that was sent by the Prophet وسلم, in which he said, لا يمس القرآن إلا طاهر. Like that... Nobody should touch the Quran except in a state of tahara, except in a state of purity. Okay, so based upon this, because there is this, like I said, famous, well-known letter from the Prophet وسلم, showing that the like the Quran should not be touched when one's not in a state of purity, we would say that based upon what we just mentioned a minute ago, that if she was going to recite from the Quran, she shouldn't touch the Quran directly. So she should put a barrier. Either she recites from memory, or she could recite from her phone, or she could recite from her iPad, or you know she can hold the the mushaf with her gloves on, or you know she uses a tissue, or she uses material or something, and yani not to touch it directly. Okay, so this is this is how um, this is the way we, we interact with that, inshallah. Then the next thing is staying in the masjid. Okay, so we have to understand that all four imams agree that it's not allowed. For the menstruating woman to actually stay in the masjid, um, and from the proofs that they gave, is it's not allowed to make tawaf of the Kaaba um, because that would mean she's going to enter into the masjid. There's also a narration that says, "I do not allow the masjid for the menstruating or the junub." And there are scholars such as Abu Dawood who they considered that hadith to be. Um, you know, from, you know, and he also Ibn Hajar, Ibn Hajar, he considered this hadith to be Hassan. Like, you know, it considered to be not strong, but like sound. Sound, that's the word. So we would say in relation to this that, you know, there's a difference between like needing to go in to get something, like, but not to just stay there for a long time, unless she had nowhere else to go. Like we saw that the, the Sahabi yet would migrate from, for example, um, um, Mecca to Al Medina, and they might have had nowhere else to live, so they lived in a certain part of the masjid or something like that. But in general, um, not to stay in the masjid. But there, usually in a masjid, there's different places you can go. Like there could be a place where they don't pray. It's sort of like, you know, they have often other rooms that's not really considered as part of the masjid. So that's fine. You know, you can just go stay there. That's what I usually advise sisters. You know, go towards those areas that they don't. Um, they're not known as the, the prayer areas, okay? We can go into more details. I think I'm just going to keep going. So then the seventh, um, the seventh thing is that obviously it's not allowed for the husband to have intercourse with his wife while she's menstruating. And um, we already gave the ayah about that. Um, but I just want to also mention something important, which was that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said do everything except intercourse when she's Menstruating, so just because we're menstruating does not mean we can't have a relationship with the husband. Like you can't have, you know, some sort of intimate relations, but not intercourse, right? Just to understand. And in fact, if you look at what the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, and I know this is, it's good to talk about because often we don't talk about these things we need to know. Um, they used to wrap like an izar around their, like the Messenger of Allah would order them to like wrap a little izar around their waist. Okay, so I'm just trying to show you that it doesn't mean that like, oh, we're in Messi, that's it, you know, nothing, nothing has to happen anymore, you know, like, um, don't even look at each other for the next seven days. Okay? Um, okay. Then we come to point eight, and that is that it's forbidden for the menstruating uh, 
It's forbidden for a man to divorce his wife while she's menstruating. Okay, it's forbidden for a man to divorce his wife while she's menstruating. Now, just to put this out, it's very important to understand, the correct way of doing tolaq, the correct way of doing a tolaq, is to, you need to wait till the wife has finished her menses, and then to divorce her in a time in which you haven't been intimate with her. And to say only one tolaq. Not like I heard recently, oh, he divorced me but like times a million. So the point is, um, that's the sunnah divorce. And the other type of is called a bid'ah divorce. All right, to divorce in that way. As for the ruling, the majority of scholars say if he divorced her while she's in her menses, it still would count. But it's an ithem on him, like it's a sin. It's, not, it's haram for him to, to divorce her when she's um, menstruating, but the majority of scholars take the ruling that she... Uh, it still counts as a divorce. Okay, why it's haram? Because it's very hard for her to count her kuru. Like the kuru is the... Because when you're in the ikda for the woman, when she's in divorce, she has to count her menstrual cycles. So if he divorces her in her menstrual cycle, she can't count that as a complete menstrual cycle. Okay, now again, you have some ikhtilaf here because as far as I remember, it's the Shafis and the Malikis, they, they count the uh, tuhur. But let's not confuse you. So, according to what Allah Ta'ala has indicated in the Quran, it's the quru is the menses. So you count the menses. So that's why it's, it's haram to divorce during the menses because it, you mean you can't count that menses. It's not a complete menses. So you're going to wait till the next menses comes and then you're going to start counting from then. That's why. Okay, um... And, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, he, you know, regarding um, Ibn Omar, he divorced his wife while she was menstruating and the Messenger of Allah told him to return. He has to return her and then wait till she becomes clean and then menstruates again and then after that when she becomes clean, uh, if you want to divorce her, you can divorce her then. Okay, let's talk about the other two things that relate to menses. So the last two things, this is, relates to ob obligations. So the first thing is al-ghusl. So that when the woman becomes clean from menstruating, then it's obligatory upon her to take al-ghusl, to, to lift al-hadath, to lift al-hadath al-akbar, like the major state of um, impurity. فَإِذَا تَطَهَّرْنَا فَأْتُوهُنَّ مِنْ حَيْثُ أَمَرَكُمُ اللَّهُ So Allah Ta'ala says, when they have purified themselves, then you may come to them in the way that Allah has legislated. All right, or ordained. And also in the hadith, it mentions when your menstruation goes away, then pray. Then take ghusl and pray. So it shows that after menses, a person, you know, a woman needs to take a ghusl in order to purify herself for prayer. Um, oh, yes. The other thing is, how do you take a ghusl after menses? Okay, so. It's exactly, basically the same way as you take for al janaba like you take also the same way. It's just that in the case of al-usul for al menses you need to, um, you know, wash out the hair. You need to wash out the hair because it's like a ruqsa, like it's like a lightening on the woman if she has like braided hair, for example. Um, it's very, for janaba to take us every time and she has to undo all her braids, it's very difficult. Okay, but in the case of menses, um, it's only you know once a month. So therefore, in that case, she should undo her hair, and give it a good wash out um, after she finishes from her uh, menses. The other, the other, the other last ruling, the last ruling regarding menses is regarding puberty, because when a, a, a girl gets her menses. This is the sign that she has reached puberty and now she becomes accountable. And the Prophet said, La yaqbalullahu salata ha'id illa bi khimar. So after that time, in order for her prayer to be accepted, she has to wear proper hijab. I mean, in the prayer, for her prayer to be accepted. Okay? So um, this is how we know that once a, woman, uh, you know, once a girl reaches puberty, that she's now fully accountable. Um, so that's so the, the, the menses is a sign of her of her becoming accountable.
Okay, I'm going to, inshallah, move on and speak about al istihada so we can have enough time to answer questions and things. All right, so we, as we said, al istihada is the irregular bleeding that comes. It's, it's coming, generally speaking, at a time other than her menses. But the, the blood is not due to menses. Like, it's actually due to, like, um, an illness or a sickness or a wound or maybe an infection, something like that. So there's another reason. It could be, it could be any of those or it could be something else. But the point is that something in her body is, it could be hormones as we know, you know. So um, it, it's extra blood that's coming in another time, irregular than her known time of her menses. So we already spoke a little bit about how to tell whether the bleeding is you know, your menstrual blood or your istahada. As I said, the main thing is if it's coming at a time different than your normal time for your menses, then you would straight away suspect that that's an istahada. Also, if your, your, your menses is extending beyond its normal time to a very unusual, like it's just going on and on and on into the sunset, basically, um, you know that it's, it's, it's not, there's something not right. It's not, it can't be, it can't be your menses anymore. If it's just going past 15 days, then you know it can't be. But if it's coming in the cycle, if it's, sorry, if it's coming, you know, outside your cycle, and like I said, if you, if you see this blood coming, especially if it's like bright red, if it's, if it's um, light, um, if it doesn't have the normal offensive smell, if you see clots coming, you know what I mean? Because um, sometimes the, don't think that, and I just want to add something too. Don't think that at least the Sahada blood can't be really heavy. There was, a, there was one of the Sahabiyat who her, her blood was so heavy they had to put a dish under her when she would pray in the masjid because of how heavy her, her blood was. And, you know, like Um Habiba, it's related that she, she had Istahada for seven years. So that should make you feel better <laughs> next time you have Istahada. So, you know, some women, they just go on and on and on. I'm going to talk about that in a minute as well. Um, but that's the main thing to look for. Look for the, get the characteristics, look for the characteristics of the blood that does help a lot. Okay, so, okay, yes. So with regards to al-istahada, so the ruling on that is when you have the istahada blood, you still pray. You still pray. You still fast from Ramadan. You're, it's still allowed for you to have be intimate with your husband. And there's different levels of istahada, as you know. Like some is light, some is heavy. Like not everyone gets heavy bleeding. Some will get light bleeding, okay? But the point is it's, it's allowed. Um, the other thing is that... Um, the other thing is... I forgot what I was going to tell you. You take wudu for every prayer, okay? Take wudu for your five prayers. That's what I'm trying to say. Take wudu for your five prayers, but you don't have to keep taking wudu for every single sunnah prayer you pray after that. Just take your prayer for your five prayer. You know, change... First of all, go wash away the blood, place a clean pad, then go take wudu and then just play and then just pray. Okay? That's the way you, you, you act with that. Now, sometimes a woman can be in a situation where her blood just goes on and on and on. Okay? What do you do in that situation where the blood just goes on and on? And you can't tell what's my period and what's is the harder. I can't tell any difference between the blood. That has happened to a lot of sisters. Right? They come to the difference between their blood. So what do you do in that case? Okay, so this, this, we, let's say there's three steps. There's three steps. The first step, if you know your time of the month, that's the, this is the best way. If you know the time of your month, that I used to always get my period on the 20th of the month. So that means, like this, and I'm talking about the case where you can't see any difference between the blood and you've got no clue which is my period, which is not, right? So what you do, you say, right, well, I used to always get my period on the 20th of the month. That means whenever the 20th of the month comes, I'm going to take, I'm going to count those days and my normal length of my period, and that's going to be as my, that's going to be my period. Okay, then after that, I take Wilson, I take Wilson, and then I take Wudu for every prayer after that. Okay, that's the first way. Another way is to do what's called a ten years, which means you distinguish between the blood. So... You don't know, I've got no clue when my cycle was. I, the last time I had a cycle was like four years ago when I had my last, you know, before I had all these four children or something, right? <laughs> you know, that happens to some people. Okay? So in that case, you try to do distinguishing between the blood. You try to see, is there a time of the month 
Is there a part of the month where it suddenly goes really heavy and different? Right? And then the rest of the month it's like this light, bright red. So if it's like that, you'll know it's that part. That's the part that's your period. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Then the, the third thing is, if you cannot tell for the life of you, <laughs> which one is what? You're just gonna have to you're just gonna have to pick, you know, you basically pick six or seven days from the, for example, the beginning of the month, and then you count that as, as your period. Okay? Um, another thing is, what about the pregnant woman who sees blood? Okay, a pregnant woman, if she sees blood, the default for the pregnant woman is that she doesn't have a period. A, woman, a pregnant woman does not have a period. That's the norm. Okay, but again, one shoe does not fit everybody. Okay? But, so we say that if you see blood while pregnant, you would not think that that's your period. So you would consider as in Alice the harder. However, there are those rare exceptional sisters, those special sisters out there, who they do still get a period. So what the scholars said is if you see it coming at the same time it was always coming every month and it's got the same appearance, a same appearance as your period always comes, you, you'll take it as your period in that case. But that's a very rare exception. But it does happen to some people. Okay? All right. Next, last thing is the nifas. So this is the postnatal bleeding. Now, again, the scholars, they differed regarding what is the maximum time for a nifas. What is the maximum time for the, the postnatal bleeding? And the majority of scholars said it's 40 days. And this is also in conjunction with what um, we have some sayings from companions as well which strengthens this view. That's why this is the more stronger view due to there being some you know, statements from Sahaba. For example, uh, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu was reported that he said the woman in Nifas should wait for, for you know, around 40 days. And Umm Salam radiallahu anha said, at the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the woman in Nifas would wait for 40 days. So we have some state sayings of Sahaba which strengthens this view. Um, the other views basically were based on Qiyas. They were based on al Qiyas. And um, so that's why, well, they're based on other, you know, other rulings. So anyway, the point is, well, Ishtihad, sorry, based on Ishtihad. So, um, so based upon that, you'd say your maximum time for your period is, sorry, your nifas is uh, 40 days. And then after that, you'll take also, if the blood's not stopping, you take also and you start to pray. Now, another important point here is sometimes your, period, your, your nifas may stop before 40 days. Some people think that even if I've got no blood, I still wait till 40 days. Like, so I could have two weeks to go and there's nothing and I just don't pray because I think, oh, well, wait, I've got to wait for 40 days. No, you don't wait for 40 days. If your blood finished two weeks early or one week early or something like that, you take all and you start to pray. Okay? Now, another point we have to speak about is in relation to... Um, if a woman has a miscarriage or even if she happens to have an abortion for some reason, that the blood that comes out, we need to understand that the blood that comes out in the first and second trimesters, that's not considered, that's not considered to be a nifas. Because why? Because a nifas, as the scholars defined it, is the blood that's associated with childbirth. But if you think about it, what's the first trimester? the nutfa stage, which is just like a drop of mixed liquid, right? And then the next stage is al-alaqa. So it's the, it's the blood clot stage. So you haven't, you haven't given birth, it's not associated with birth. The blood scene, scene after that is not associated, associated with birth. Therefore, we will not rule on it as nifas. Therefore, what do you think we rule on it? Al istahada, irregular bleeding. It's, ir it's therefore irregular bleeding. So what do I do? I take wudu for each prayer. I wash away the blood and I take wudu for each prayer. However, now, this is another thing that can happen. If it's after those two, like, if it's after the, so it's in the, um, did I say trimesters? I should, maybe I shouldn't use that word. Because it's 40 days and then 40 days. Okay? So I don't, I don't make it confused because I'm thinking trimesters, they probably, they probably are... Uh, 
They probably make that in a different measurement. Anyway, so it's the 40 days and another 40 days. So you've got the nutba, you've got the alaqa. Then we come to the mudgha stage. That's after 80 days. Now, if you had, if, you know, you had a same miscarriage after 80 days, right? Usually the baby is not going to really form until around about 90 days. Like 90 days it's going to start maybe getting some arms and having some features of being like, uh, yeah. So what the scholar said, if it's coming in that doubtful period where you don't know what the ruling would be, if you can, I mean, if, if you're able, to have a look at it just to see, because you need to know, is it going to be coming under more like a blood clot or is it coming more under actually being formed that I need to take the ruling of nifas? Okay, but once it's getting over 100 days, once it's getting over like, you know, obviously towards 120 days, you know that most likely, as long as it hasn't stopped growing very, very early, you understand, that um, it's going to be most likely nifas because it's associated with the, the child, like it's actually considered as, you know, blood associated with childbirth. Okay, that's, that's what we need to understand about that. Um... Yeah. Oh, you mean to check? Yeah. If it's like a human, then it's yeah. So if it's coming under a human form, like it's got the formation of arms, legs, like it's looking like a child, then obviously you're going to take that blood as a ruling that it's nifas blood. But if it doesn't look anything like that, it's you know it's um, still unformed, like a, a blood clot, then it's basically like irregular bleeding. Okay. Um. Jizaki Okay, just, uh, okay, I'll give you two more things and then that's it. And then we'll, we'll do the questions. So the next thing is, this can happen. A woman could have a wet dream at the beginning of her menses or she could have been intimate with her husband and then, like, you know, intercourse with her husband and then straight after it, she got her menses. That can happen. So now, what happens? Like, so what we'll say here is, look, it's not obligatory upon her to go and take awesome. However, if she wants to read the Quran, she's going to need to take awesome. That also she, she, she takes is just to remove the hadath of al janaba All right? I'll ask you to add on that one. Yeah. What if, like, during her menses, she releases? Yeah. So if a woman during her menses, same thing. If she... Um, Okay, to go be okay, we probably, probably have to because these days we have to talk about everything. But anyway, not just wet dreams. Even if she was awake, and let's say she engaged in masturbation, let's just say it. You know, she shouldn't because we're not we're not supposed to do that. But just say she did, and she got climax. Not just masturbation because you could masturbate and not climax, right? But just say she did climax, she would therefore be in a state of janaba. I had sisters tell me that they went to shit our glasses. Right? And the sheikhs, they said, look, for the, for the, the menstruals, just you read that on your own. Like, and you can't learn like that. Like, this is something we need to go into details, right? Anyway, the point is, if this happened, okay, if this happened, then in, in order to, for her to be allowed to read the Quran, she would need to take wusu to remove that janaba. Okay? So that, that wusu there is separate than the wusu she has to take at the end when she finishes her, when she finishes her menstruals. However, let's say she didn't take, she didn't read Quran the whole time, which I don't know how you could do that, but just say she didn't read the Quran the whole time until the end, and then she finished her menses and she still got the janaba. When she takes wusul for the for the hayid, like for the for the hayid, for the for the menses, it lifts it lifts the menses with the janaba. Okay, so it's not like you to get take two separate. No, you just take one in that case that lifts both. Got it, everybody? Last thing, last thing is the blood that's seen by a woman over the age of 50. Okay, so in general, the people of knowledge considered the blood seen by a woman over the age of 50 as istahada. Okay? Um, and that's regardless of how the blood is. That's a shafri and some of the, 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 the uh, manaki and the hanabila. However, others said, and this is the more balanced view, look to see if it's coming in a pattern. So like there are, look, and by the way, I think it's the Hanafis, they say no 70. So there are, again, all these rulings, there's no 
set ruling in the Sunnah that says, oh, once you reach 50, anything after that is not menses. Okay, so what they, they, how they based their ruling was they said, what's the order for most women? Most women finish their menses by 50. But I've known sisters to be in their 70s and still menstruating. So in her case, if, if your menses is coming every month at the same time and a known time and coming with the description, you know, the, the characteristics of menses, you'll still consider it as your menses. Also, if in your family, female members, that they all menstruated after the age of 50, that's also another, another um, guideline. However, if your menses had stopped, you know, and then two or three years later, you saw this blood and you're like 55, you would not think that that's your menses. You would think that that's irregular bleeding. Do you understand? So this is how this ruling does help us to, to be able to um, interact with that, okay? So um, that's, the, look, that's my main points. They, they're like, there was more I could add, but I just wanted to really speak about the most important um, points. And inshallah, what I'll do now is I'll try to go through as many of these uh, questions as I can. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, well, inshallah. <laughs> we'll be here till like midnight. <laughs> okay, so... Now, okay, so if you finish at Asr or at Alisha, do you join Dhuhr and Asr? Okay, so if you just say you finish at Asr time, what you'll do to be on the safe side and what the Jumbur, like the majority of scholars have said, but there are scholars that disagree, but majority say that if you finish at Asr, you pray the prayer that's connected to it. So you'll pray Dhuhr first, don't shorten the prayer, you're only combining the prayer, right? So you pray Dhuhr first, four rakat, and then you'll pray your Asr prayer four rakat. And if it's mag Maghrib, if you finished um, at Isha time, you'll pray your Maghrib three rakat and you'll pray your Isha four rakat. Is that okay? in Safar or regular? Pardon? Is that only in Safar? No, no, no. This is what I'm saying. This has got to do with menses now. Oh, okay. This has got to do with menses. Yeah, I know, but menses when you're in Safar or the, the No, no, no. Part? Okay, so even if you're in another thing, another thing, you reminded me of something. If you were if you were travelling, if you were travelling when you got your period and you got it at Asr and you haven't prayed Dhuhr because you were travelling, you know what I mean? Because you know you're allowed to combine prayers when you're travelling. So what you would do when you finish your menses, you need to make up that Dhuhr, but you pray it as four. Because you're a resident now. You know what I mean? And uh, and you would pray your Asr as four, unless you're still on the move. Do you understand? So that's another ruling. So but yeah, so if you were travelling when you got your menses and you hadn't prayed Dhuhr yet because you're combining your prayer and then it came to Asr and then you suddenly got your period and you're, you're travelling, when you get Dhuhr, when you, when you get like clean from your menses, you need to pray Dhuhr and Asr, but you pray it four and four because you're most likely a resident now. Okay? But going back to what I was saying, so because a woman who's menstruating comes under what's called, she's got Uzr, she's got an excuse. And the person who's travelling has an excuse. So that's why the scholars said, those who have excuses, they, their prayer time is combined. That's why I said to you, if you get clean and asr, you combine it, you, you pray your dhuhr first, and then you pray asr. And you know what, I like this view in a lot of ways because sometimes you're not really sure have you finished or not. And you've got that doubt. Did I finish in dhuhr or did I finish in asr? So this way you feel, you feel comfortable that you know what, alhamdulillah, I've prayed both anyway, I've, I've covered myself. I, I, I like this, you understand? <laughs> then Maghrib, you just pray Maghrib. You don't pray Asr, okay? It's only the ones you combine together. If it's already time for Fajr, no. But the scholars said if you've got time, if you finished in the last part of the night and you've still got time to pray uh, Maghrib and Isha, they said pray Maghrib and Isha as well. <laughs> before the end of the night. Look, some of these issues are disputable, but just be on the safe side. Like, at the end of the day, we already miss enough prayers as it is with our menses. Why not just, why not just, you know, if you know you're clean, it's Ramadan, for example, you staying up all night, and then you got clean, just pray your Magad You know what I mean? What's, a, what's, a, what's an extra prayer on your... Who's going to complain about extra prayers on their Mizan Hasanat? Is that after you know? 
Yeah, 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 when you finished your menses. So you have to fire, fire No, I'm talking about yeah. if you finished, just say you stayed up all night, yeah. and it was like three o'clock in the morning, and you, you found yourself, you saw the loss of the bay dot, like you saw the white discharge, or you know you're 100% sure you're clean, go take awesome pray Magamesha. Okay? All right. So this is about going back to the, the Quran recitation. Is it allowed during menses? So what I was saying to you is, um, look, I, like, look, yes, if you read about the fuqaha, they don't allow, like, they, they didn't allow, many of the fuqaha did not allow women to recite while she's in her state of menses. But we have to look at what did they base that upon, okay? They based it upon a weak hadith, which is not authentic to be taken as a proof. And also they based it upon making qiyas between a menstruating woman and a, and a person in junul, jun, who's junul. And if you can see that, that, that they are not the same, it's a qiyas ma'al fariq. Like there's, there's a difference between like her ability to remove her state of menses and a person who's in the state of janaba, they can easily remove. That's why scholars said, based upon that, especially, and especially there's a hajj, like she's got a need, like, you know, you're trying, you try, okay, if you're trying to memorize the Quran, you can't stay away from the Quran for seven days. If you're a teacher of Quran or you're in a Quran class, you're going to miss every single yani, and as it is a woman, think about too, a woman's iman already is weak enough when she goes in menses, so she's in need for a connection with Allah Ta'ala, you know, so based upon all of these things, that's why my view, which I firmly, I'm fairly comfortable with it, is to recite the Quran but don't touch the Mus'haf directly with your hands. That's, that's the view that I feel is um, the most, you know. And also, istahada, I said to you, you can do anything. When you got ista, al istahada, you pray, you fast, means you can still recite the Quran too. Okay? Oh my God, now you put multiple questions. This is an essay. <laughs> this is like... <laughs> This is like a HSC paper. <laughs> okay, um, okay, but it's actually a good question though, I like it. Alright, is it permissible to take medication to prevent your period during Ramadan, Hajj or Umrah? So look sister, it is permissible. It is permissible, especially if you know it's not going to be harmful personally for you. Okay, now when I say that, I'm not encouraging you to go take, me, 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 uh, you know, uh, when we put medication to stop your period, especially in Ramadan, I'm not encouraging you because that's what Allah wrote for you. Like that's what, as the message of Allah said, this is what Allah wrote for the daughters of, of Adam. You know, Ali Sanan. So it's natural, and you know, and so yeah, this is what Allah chose for you. So, but as you know, like it's happened to me before, where every single year, without fail, because my 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 menses moves back ten days every year. So with every single year without fail. When does my menstruation come? The last 10 days of Ramadan. Every single year without fail. It's like, no, I am, that's it, mate. I can't take this anymore, you know what I mean? And if you, if you go to Hajj or Umrah, okay, look, when you go to Hajj and Umrah, sisters, then without going to the Haram, what are you going to do? Like, there's not much more to do. That, that's, that is your Hajj and Umrah, like the whole time going to, except for when you're in, like, Stag and Shisha, like, you're not, do you understand? So, in general, um, you know, in general, like if you just want to have a peaceful, peace, peaceful mind, um, you know, there's no harm in you taking the uh, medication to to prevent it, as long as your doctor tells you that that's safe for you. That you've got to check it with your doctor. I can't tell you things that's you know, you've got to check with your doctor. Um, Sorry, is it permissible every single Ramadan to do that? Because I've heard you can do it as a one-off. Like look, there's no look. It's it's there's nothing there's nothing wrong with it. But it's better not to. It's better not to. It's better go because it, look. After a while, taking the, these these medications do have an effect on you. Like you'll know that they stuff up your cycle. Everything gets stuffed up. It's not really. It's not really a good thing to keep on. You know, doing that to yourself. But if you know, but I'm saying it's allowed. Okay. Yeah. Look, some of these you're gonna have to just message me because I need to talk to you. Like sometimes I've got to with the the period questions. Sometimes I need to ask more questions, go into more details to kind of like work out what's going on. Um, tawaf, you can obviously. Thought I should put the ones I've done over here. Um, tawaf, you can you can do it while you've got Ali's tahada. But what you would do is you, like I said, wash away the blood, place the pad, and then you would take wudu, and then you would uh, just do tawaf. Because you can't do anything about it. It's the same if someone had a. Um, some people have 
May Allah give us all a saha wa afia, but some people they have like a bag attached to them. You know what I'm trying to say? So they've got constant urine coming out of them. It's the same thing. They're going to take wudu and then they're just going to do tawaf the way they are. They can't, you know, stop that. Um, Suddenly, istikhara, it's no harm if you if you really wanted to ask Allah Ta'ala that there's no barriers, we shouldn't place barriers. If you want to ask Allah Ta'ala, just make the dua. Just make the dua if you're not able to do the two, you know, the rakatain of um, al istikhara. Just you know, uh, you know, just make a dua and ask Allah to guide you, you know what I mean, inshallah. Okay, so what's permissible? Again, I hope those little kids are gone. So what's permissible while you are um, got your menses? So look, let's understand something. The place where the blood is coming out is considered to be a place of najasa now. Due to the blood, the, the blood is najis. Let's get that clear. The blood of menses is najis. Therefore, the place where it's coming out is najis. But not to feel bad about ourselves. And that's why the Messenger of Allah told Aisha radiallahu anha, when she asked him, how can I get your prayer mat from the masallah? He said, your, your menses is not in your hand. It's not in your hand. So it's not that your hand becomes najis due to your menses. It's not that your body becomes najis. You understand? And that's why the Messenger of Allah even showed it so beautiful. He had those intimate times with his wife where... You know, like with Aisha, he would bite from the bone while she was menstruating, and then he'd give it to her, and you know, and, and she would, like, she would eat from the bone, and then he would place his mouth on exactly the same place where she had placed her mouth, or he would drink from the cup where she exactly placed his, his on purpose placed his mouth exactly where she placed her mouth to show her that you know you're still loved despite having your menses. It's not like you all, be, you know, you become yourself like unclean. Okay, but in saying that, so with regard to intimacy, so that area should be avoided. That that the area where the blood's coming, it's all it's all um, it's najis where the blood is. So you avoid the najasa. Like as mu'minin, like what does Allah say? Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabina, where you have you hibbu you hibbu mutatahirin. Allah loves those who make tawbah constantly and they love to purify themselves. So the mu'min does not like najasa. The mu'min does not love you know, un- impure things or, you know, so you avoid that. But anything else, you know, you know, any other ways of enjoying the body, there's nothing wrong with it as long as you're just avoiding the place of Najasa. That's what we can say about it. Okay? Let's just leave it there. I think, Yanni, I've answered most of the questions. Ugh. Let me see. Okay. All right. You know, what? one thing I will do, which is important, Someone's asking, can you outline the correct process for al ghusl That's an important question. So, um, how to take al ghusl look, it's so easy. Some people overcomplicated it, it's so easy. All you have to do, number one, start by washing the private part, okay? So just wash the private part from any uh, fluids. And then, take wudu as usual. Take wudu as usual. Then after you take wudu, pour the water over the hair, over the head three times, and then just rub the scalp, making sure that the, the water is reaching into the, the scalp. Okay, so if you've got if you're doing the from Janaba, if you had a ponytail in or you had, you know, you had a hairstyle, you don't need to undo the whole hairstyle. You just need to make sure the water has poured over your head three times and you've just tried to, you know, massage the Massage the um, water into the scalp, but if you if you finish menses, then you're going to take out your you know your plait or your you know your hairband, and you're going to completely wash out the hair and comb it out, or whatever, right? And then pouring water over the body, so the body reaches, sorry, the water reaches the whole body, and that's it. That's all wolf is. That's as simple as it is. That's complete wolf, by the way. That's complete wolf. There's another wolf you can do, which is. If you okay, this is called what I call emergency wuss. It's emer- no, it is, and it's acceptable, and it's it's called sufficient wuss, right? If you finish your menses and the sun is going to come up within about like half an hour or, or twenty minutes, what you're allowed to do, and it's sufficient, is you go, you have your niya for al ghusl to remove the like to remove the impu- you know the state of hadath, and then you you know wash out the, the mouth and nose and pour the water completely over the body. And th- that's it. That's all you have to do. And then as long as the water reached the whole part of the body, of course, of course, over the hair as well, right? Then that's it. And then you go, 
Um, and you go, Yanni, of course, dry yourself off. <laughs> so you have to pray like that. And then that's it. And you go pray. That's called sufficient wuss. Um, as long as you've got the near with it, um, then it's it's uh, acceptable wuss. But, you know, but in general, we try to do the complete wuss with the sunnah of doing doing the wudu as well. Yeah. Yeah. See, look, you've got to understand something. The, the sunnah, the sunnah is to start with the right side. Okay? But it's not a fad, it's not going to nullify your ghusl if you don't start. But the sunnah is to start with the right side pouring. And also, you've got to think, what were they, you know, pouring the water with a jug? You know, we've got a shower now. So, you, you're not going to pour over, you know, but what you do is when you're, when you're washing, you know, the, the body, you, you go, you kind of, you know, you just start. Uh, you know, go for the right side and do you understand like that? So, um, but that's it. But that, but that's what it comes down to under. It's just coming under the sunnah. That's it. Okay? Yes? Is it also the same for a man? The same type of whistle for a man? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And even our children. We need to teach our children this. Like once they go, once they go through puberty, like the boy when he's having his wet dreams, he needs to take whistle. We need to teach them. They need to know because otherwise they're not. They're praying in a state of janaba. Okay, and the girls, if they've got their menses, yes. Can you just quickly tell us uh, when a woman is about to give birth? When oh yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so, so like we said, the blood that comes out, the nifas blood is the blood that's associated with birth. Now, if she is in the actual labour contractions where they're coming, you know, as you know, <laughs> they're coming full on, okay, and then she starts to see blood, then that because that blood is now associated with the birth, that's why scholars said that you know that then she won't pray after that. And actually, while we're on the topic, let's just talk about when you stop praying when you're in a state of childbirth. Let's just talk about that. I think everyone needs to know this. Now, look, sisters, as long as you haven't got that blood come out due to the childbirth, then you've got to keep on praying. And I want to tell you a tip, very important tip. <laughs> Please pass it on down to your grandchildren, your, gra your great granddaughters, you know. So, you know the way childbirth is, it starts off not that bad and it starts to get really painful. It's getting very hard for you to pray later on, okay? So, what you would do in that case, when you know it's going to be very hard for you, you're allowed to combine your prayers that are able to be combined. So, what you would do, because you've got an excuse. So, what, it's like someone who's going to travel. But not shorten, don't shorten the prayers, you combine. So what you do is, just say you're going into labour and it's Dhuhr. Pray Dhuhr and pray Asr because you, you know what? By the time Maghrib comes, you're not, <laughs> you're not trying to say so. So if you can combine the prayer, it can help you. Obviously, if you're not in a state of prayer, like the, any, sorry, if you're not in a state where you can even think of praying, like you're just like screaming your head off and it's like the last minutes, like Kholas, you know, you're going to have to... What can you do? Look, in general, like as long as the, the baby hasn't come out yet and as long as you haven't got the blood, which normally you do, towards the, the end you will get blood. So once you see that blood, that's it. You don't have to worry anymore. Okay? But I just want you to know because some people think that if their water breaks, they don't need to take wudu, uh, they don't need to pray anymore. But look, as you know, your water could break one month before you give birth. And what, are you not going to pray for a whole month before you give birth? So you can't, judge, you can't say it's based upon that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I'll check it. I'll check it because if you, you have to check, because as far as I know, most of them agree that when it's actually right in front of the birth, like, like with the, the labour pains and everything, then they say that that is nifas. So I'll check it. I'll, I'll check it up again. I'll check the view of Imam Shafi'i rahmallah. I'll tell you. But yeah, as you're saying, normally, because Imam Shafi'i rahmallah, he agrees with. Um, he agrees with the Hanbali Madhab in that during when you've got your, uh, you, you know, the pregnant one does not get period. That's why. He takes that view that a pregnant one does not get period. But as we said, if we look at it, there are women who actually do get their period. So, no, no, that some women actually get periods. They get it every month and they get it exactly like a period. So that's why this other scholars looking at all of that, they've said that if that did happen to you and that's not normal, you would in, you'd have to take it as your period in that case. Yeah, I mean, there's all these like exceptions. That's why, oh my God, fiqh just makes you. <laughs> anyway, um, so, 
Yeah. Yeah. Inshallah. Sorry, I just wanted to know. So if you've got, you said if you've got your periods and you need to do a listen to start fasting, you said that you don't have to do like the listen straight away. You That's right. Fasting. When have you got till like? Well, the, when you've got till is till like you need to hurry up and take listen because you want to pray your Fajr prayer. Yeah. And the Fajr prayer can't, you know, the, the Fajr prayer ends by the sun rising. Okay, so therefore, like, but say you, you know, you want to have your suhoor. You don't have to rush and go and take your ghusl to, 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 to be able to fast. So you can just sit down, take your suhoor, you know, you've got your, you know, put your intention you're going to fast, take it easy, and then, and then after that the adhan goes and, and you go and you take your ghusl and then you go pray before, before the sun comes up. That's it. But you just need to know that you don't have to have, um, you don't have to have taken ghusl in order to fast. And if, you, if it was a sunnah fast, if it was a, if it was a sunnah fast, then it, it, it wasn't, it, you know, you didn't have to have an intention, you didn't have to have your intention before, before Fajr in order to, um, in order, yeah, like you could, you could have made your intention after that. You could start, you know, you just decide that after Fajr, like after Fajr times already started that, you know what, I'm going to fast today. Yeah? Okay. So as I said, if you've got any individual questions, uh, um, I can just leave my phone number and you can just... I don't actually, I try to very much avoid any phone calls, just so you know. So all I do is I answer on WhatsApp and Facebook. They're my two um, mediums of answering questions because otherwise it's just too time consuming.